the world tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Well, my friends, where is the true church today? I mean the real, original church that Jesus Christ said he would build. Now, he didn't say he'd build a lot of churches. He didn't say he would build many differing denominations. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Well, my friends, then he built it. But what happened to it? Where did it go? Now, we find that there was a prophecy that there would be a falling away, that the second coming of Christ, which he had also foretold because he said that he was going away, he was going to heaven, and he said, if I go, I will come again. But uh, he had said that, that is, it said through um, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians in Second Thessalonians that that day would not come in the day of Christ and of his coming, except there be a falling away first. Now, we know that apostasy was definitely prophesied. Did that mean that the church itself would fall away from the truth, that the church would apostatize and then perhaps later be reformed, or did it just uh, go wrong and stay wrong? What did happen to the church? My friends, when you understand first what the church is, we've been going into that a great deal on this program, and when you understand what the church, the real church that Jesus founded is, you will know that that church did not and cannot fall away from the truth because the church is made up of those who are in the truth. The church, the true church of God, is made up of those who have and are led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God doesn't lead you away, but into the truth. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth is come, he will lead you into all truth. And so the Spirit of God is the Spirit of a sound mind and the Spirit that leads people into truth, not away from it or out of it. And the church are those begotten children of God, sons of God as they're called, but not either male or female, not bond or free or Jew nor Greek, all one in Christ Jesus. The church is made up of those that are actually begotten of God, who have the Holy Spirit of God who have yielded to God and who are governed by God. And when you're really governed by God and your mind is controlled by God through his Holy Spirit and being led into the truth, you're not apostatizing. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone in the truth knows all the truth or that anyone in the true church has all knowledge. Oh, no, because the people in the church are those who are growing in grace and in knowledge. They don't have it all yet. So they may have some error that they've always had, but what I mean is they're not turning from truth into error. They are not apostatizing. They are not falling away because those that do that fall out of the church, and they're not in it anymore. And those that are away from the truth are not in the church. That's the thing we've been bringing out. The church of God, my friends, is not a visible political organization. The Church of God is not a group of people that you see going into some church building or the collection of all of the people in all of the church buildings that you see visibly going in to sit in pews and seats in church buildings. That is not the way the Bible describes the church. Now, when we understand the truth, my friends, the real church that Jesus did build is not, as I say, a visible organization of people that you see, it's not a political organization, and it isn't in politics of any kind at all, because politics is where you try to make up your own mind and you vote, and one person believes one way and another another, and the majority rule or something of that sort, or you play politics. Now, in the real church, they're all governed by God. Everyone in that church is governed by God Almighty. If you're not being governed by God, if you're not sincerely to the best of your knowledge and ability, trying to live by every word of God and studying your Bible so that you may grow in knowledge and do that better day by day, then you're not in the church. We might as well wake up and face it. That applies to every one of us, my friends. Those in the true church are becoming perfect, and day by day they're growing in that direction. If you're to ever enter the family of God, 
since the father of that family is perfect, then the whole family is, and you'll have to become perfect by that time. Of course, God will make you perfect. You'll never make yourself that way. Again, without holiness, none shall see the Lord, and you have to become holy. Well, we're pretty unholy, my friends, when we start out. We're so filthy that it takes the blood of Christ to have paid the penalty in our sins so that we can be reconciled to God and have the stigma, the penalty of our transgressions, transgressions against God, removed from us. Now, there's no politics because the government comes down from God. The mind of God rules. Those are the ones in the true church. Well, now let me give you the truth about the church and what happened to it. Let's go right back to the beginning. And I want to show you, my friends, this is going to astound you. This is almost dumbfounding knowledge, and it has taken, let me tell you, it has taken months and years of the most careful research into the history clear back to the time of Jesus Christ and the apostles to defend this truth that I'm going to begin to give you now. I'm going to show you that church. I'm going to show you what happened to that church. I'm not going to go into it in full detail, but I'm going to give you a bird's eye view of it. We're going to skim through some of it, so listen. I want to give you the real truth. Here is the truth now about the church. Where is that church today? What's happened to it? First, you have to know what to look for when you go searching history to find that church. Well, almost 2,000 years ago, a messenger came to this earth from heaven bearing startling news of a coming world government. He talked about world government. Now, if I talk about that in some quarters today, they say I'm talking politics. Oh, no, my friends. Politics is human division, and what this is not of human doing. This is an act of God. This kind of world government is something that is going to be set up by God and not by men. Well, that messenger was, of course, Jesus Christ. His message was the good news. Now, the word gospel means good news. And it was the good news of the kingdom, that is, the coming world-ruling government of God. Not government of man, by man, but government of God. Government by God, but for man. You know, man does not know properly how to govern himself, believe it or not. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, and your Bible says that way is going to end up in death. The wages of sin is death. And there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end of which are the ways of death. That's in your Bible. That's what God says. Now, you just witness the conditions in the world today if you think men know how to govern themselves. Oh, I tell you, we just don't have any world peace at all. Look how much energy is being wasted and blown up in strife. Men trying to oppose each other, each trying to, not maybe uh, both sides of the deal, trying to rule the world, but at least one trying to rule the world, and the other trying to defend their own freedoms. That's what we have in the world today. Well, Jesus' message was good news, and it was the world-ruling government of God that is coming. The very family of God into which we must be born to gain eternal life. You find about the government of God in Mark 1, 14, speaking of what Jesus preached. But you find Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, mentioning that that kingdom of God is something into which we can be born in John 3, verses 3 to 5. So it's something we can be born into. It is a family. It's a family that is a governing family, a ruling family, a God family, and God is ruler. Now... Jesus came to deliver this message from God to man. He did not come to preach it personally in his own person to the whole world. No, Jesus spent his ministry preparing the foundation for the church. God works through human agencies. Jesus appointed and called his own disciples. Disciple means a student or a learner, one who is going to school, to college, as it were, and learning. And they were disciples. Now, later they became what? Why, later they became apostles. And an apostle is, of course, one definition is one who is sent, but another is sent as an ambassador with authority, representing the government of God in heaven and with the authority of that government in a foreign or a strange country. 
And that's what the true minister of God is. He's an ambassador of Christ. And the true minister of God carries the very authority of Christ. And all power in heaven and in earth has been given to him. So he prepared the foundation for the building of the church, and the church is commissioned to carry the gospel to the world. Jesus didn't try to just do that himself. All right. Now the church is the body of Christ, and the reason it's the body of Christ is this. Listen carefully. Jesus did certain work, and his work was a preparatory work, the founding, the basic work of getting a foundation under it for the church to go out and carry the gospel. But Jesus did work, and it was the work of God. It was the start of the thing. It was the start of the church. He brought the message. He taught that message to his disciples. But he said, of myself, I can do nothing. Of himself, he was as helpless as any human being, and we're all a lot more helpless than we realize. Of myself, he said, I can do nothing. But he said, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. The power of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God was in him. And it was he was empowered by an outside power that came from without and empowered him and gave him power. So he had power over the laws of nature. He had power even over men's minds. Now, my friends, Jesus also came to die for us, and when he died, he was resurrected, and he went to heaven. Now, he didn't just bow out. No, he still runs it. But now he runs it from heaven. And he said if he went to heaven, he would send the Holy Spirit for those of his church. And then on that day of Pentecost, that same identical power that had done the work of God in the body of Christ, in his personal human body before he died, that same power entered now into the collective body of his disciples, and they became the church. Now, the same power, doing the same work and directed from heaven by Jesus Christ, who was sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, directed by God, Christ is the head of the church, that same power was doing the work in and through the collective body, the combined human bodies of those apostles. Now they had been fully trained. They had been taught of Jesus as students are learning for three and a half years. That's why, my friends, the church is the body of Christ, because it's the collective human body of all of the sum total of various individual human bodies, the one collective body in and through which the Spirit of God is doing the work of God. Now let me tell you something, my friends, and get this carefully. No one is in the true church who is not having a part in that work of God, in that commission of God. It's a dual commission. First, there's the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, as a body, as a collective body, they have a second commission, and that's to feed the flock. And the church is the mother of us all, and we become begotten children of God, not just born like the mother must protect and feed and nourish the unborn child. So the church, Jerusalem above, the mother of us all. Yes, Jerusalem, the mother of us all, the true church of God, is the mother of all of the children of God that are in it. And so God has set some in the church, first apostles. Yes, and then in the administrative division, next come evangelists, and then pastors, and then teachers of various kinds, and they were called elders. As a matter of fact, even apostles and evangelists are all elders. But of the elders under the pastors, there were both preaching and non-preaching elders. Some were teachers and not preachers even. And that they were set in the church for what? For the work of the ministry, yes, and for the feeding of the flock till we all come to the full stature, the full-grown man, because we are individually, if we're in the church, being developed and being trained to grow spiritually, ready to be born into the kingdom of God, the very divine family of God, immortal, holy, divine beings in the very kingdom, the very family of God. And God has given us the work to do. Now then, if you're in that true church, my friends, there are two things you as an individual have to do. One is your part in the collective body, the body of Christ. And there are two things the collective body has to do. First and first and foremost, get this gospel to the whole world. The true church of God, then, is the one that is carrying the same gospel that Jesus preached, 
and is carrying that same good news of the kingdom of God as Jesus said they would at this time in Matthew 24, verse 13, or verse 14, carrying it to the whole wide world as a witness to all nations. And secondly, that is feeding and nourishing the true flock with the true spiritual food and not with false doctrines. Now, secondly, as an individual, clear aside from your part in the collective body, you have another job to do, and that is do two, two things you do in preparing yourself to grow individually. Of course, the main part of your growth, or one of the main parts of your growth, is your part in the collective work of carrying this gospel to the world and feeding the flock. But the other is your own personal, private, individual part of going to work on your own self and developing yourself. First, rooting out everything that's evil, everything that's wrong, letting the Bible correct you, reprove you, in other words, of overcoming. And you find a lot about overcoming in the New Testament. And if you're not an overcomer, you will never be born again. You will never get into the kingdom of God. First, you have to overcome everything that's evil, everything that's wrong, all the bad habits, all the wrong thinking, all the wrong doctrines, all the wrong ideas, by opening your mind and by opening your heart and letting God with the Holy Spirit come into your mind and your heart. And secondly, you must grow in knowledge, yes, and in grace, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's his knowledge, the same knowledge he has. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're in the true church, that's what you have. And you will be first rooting out the evil, and secondly, bringing in more of the good that you didn't have before, growing in good and in knowledge and in grace and in holy spiritual character, and in the good qualities, the spiritual qualities. Now, well, my friends, every individual who is doing that is in the true church. And uh, I think I've just given you a pretty good picture of the true church. Where is that church? Do you know? Do you belong to it? You can't join it, my friends. No, God puts you in. By one spirit we are all baptized, and the word baptized means immersed or put into, inducted into the one body, the body of Christ, the church of God. By one spirit we're all put into that one body of Christ. So that's the way you get in. You're inducted into it by receiving the spirit of God. And it's not a selfish life. You can't just crawl on your own shell and... Say, oh, I love me, and I'm wild about myself, and I put my arms around myself and give myself a squeeze, but I don't love anybody else. You can't do that and be a Christian. No, you've got to be concerned about others, and not just your private life and your next-door neighbors and, and all that sort of thing, but, my friends, God has given us a collective work of getting the gospel to the world. And that should be next to our hearts of everybody who is in God's own true church. You know, it's a wonderful program. It's a wonderful plan that God has given to his church. What happened to that church? Now, let's look into it. Well, Jesus devoted his ministry to calling out disciples, teaching them the gospel, setting them an example by his own ministry to follow his steps. He authorized them with the greatest commission ever given to human beings to preach the gospel the gospel of the kingdom of God, and it's good news that the kingdom of God will rule the world and bring peace to this world. There won't be any hydrogen bombs as a threat to destroy anybody then. I don't know, frankly myself, whether they're going to do away with atomic power and all that sort of thing. It may be harnessed and put to a good use, and maybe it'll be done away. I don't know what Christ is going to do when he comes to rule, but there won't be any war and there won't be any hate between nations. We'll have peace. And the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the eternal God as the ocean bed is covered with water. Yes, and we're going to have prosperity and happiness and good health, and everybody's going to know how good it is to be alive. And it can be good to be alive if you follow God's way, God's laws. Now, before Jesus ascended to the throne of God, he commanded the apostles and the disciples to remain in Jerusalem until they were imbued with the Holy Spirit. That's the same power that did the work of God in him, and which also at the same time made them begotten sons of God that put eternal life within them. They were begotten children of God. 
and endued them with the power of God to carry on his work, the same spirit that had been doing the work in Christ. Now, Jesus founded his church by sending the promised Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It was an inspired church. It was a church in which Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, was living his life, through which Jesus began to preach and to publish his gospel to the whole world. Now, Jesus was beginning to preach his gospel to the world by and through the church. It was still Christ doing it in and through the body, the disciples here, now apostles and other disciples, through the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, the true church is the collective body of individuals which have been called out from the ways, the beliefs of this present evil world who have totally surrendered themselves to the rule of God and who, through the Holy Spirit, become the begotten sons of God. You'll read that in Romans 8 9. Now, Jesus purchased the church, this church, by the shedding of his own blood. He bought and paid for it. It belongs to him. It's his church. The true church is not a politically organized body, a group of people at all. It's not a visible organization. It is an invisible spiritual organism. It's those people that are individually and collectively led by the power of God, the Spirit of God, and by Christ in heaven, who is the head of the church. Now, God put you in it. You can't join it. The church is called the body of Christ because it is the spiritual organism whose living, active head is Christ in the same sense that the husband is the head of a wife and is doing the work of God now in the same way that Jesus, through his one human body, was doing it on earth during his earthly lifetime. Now, I want you to notice that from the very beginning, the church was subject to the rule of God. They didn't vote. They didn't make up their own ideas. They didn't do what they wanted. They didn't do the way of the other nations or the other people around them. It wasn't a government by the will of man or boards of men. Jesus is the head of the church. He rules the church. Now, directly under Jesus, God set apostles first in positions of authority to carry out God's will to be instruments in his hands through which instruments he could spread the gospel and lead the church. However, an apostle has no authority whatsoever to make up his own mind or make a decision of his own and his own human free will about anything. He must be led by Christ, the head of the church, as Christ is led by God the Father, who is the head of everything. But there's authority, and it's the authority of Christ, not of man. Now, Paul the Apostle was a man like that. He was subject to Christ. He was so yielded to God that Jesus could make his will known to the Apostle Paul, and he could use him in directing the work of the church and in preaching the gospel to the nations at that time. Now, I want you to notice, if you jot this down and read it after the program, you'll notice that in Acts 16, verse 6, where Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, made known to Paul that he was not to preach the word in Asia, but Paul wanted to, and Paul was not free to. He was not free to go where he pleased. He was directed by Christ. He couldn't do what he pleased. Under Paul, in authority, but Paul was in authority, but it was the authority of Christ. He was so close to Christ that Christ could use him as an instrument. Now, under Paul in authority were the evangelists. Some of them, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and so on, who assisted the apostles by carrying out the will of God as Jesus revealed it to the apostle Paul, and as he, in turn, gave order to them. Under the authority of the apostles and the evangelists were pastors in all the local churches. And uh, there were teaching elders in local congregations. You'll read that in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Now, this, my friends, was the government of God. It was church government. It was not a national, or it was not world government. This is not the kingdom of God. It's only the church of God. This is not civil government over any nation. It's not human government. It is merely the divine government of God in his church for carrying out his work on this earth. Now, the Father manifested his will to Jesus. Jesus revealed the Father's will to the apostles. 
And they, in turn, revealed it to the evangelists. And there was authority all the way down the line. And through the apostles and the evangelists, God's will was manifested then to the local churches. And before he ascended to the Father, Jesus prayed that his church would be kept as one, one in unity. It would be kept as one in the Father's name. Holy Father, he prayed, keep through thine own name. How is he going to keep them one? Keep through thine own name those thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are, as Jesus and the Father are one. Two separate individuals, of course, two separate persons, but one God, one in mind and in unity and harmony of purpose and of mind and in way of life and everything of the kind. Now, the true church, which is called the Church of God in 12 different places in the New Testament. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. The true church is not many divided, quarreling divisions or anything of that sort or groups of people, but it is one church composed of many members. One church united in spirit and mind and attitude and heart because its members have every one of them totally surrendered their wills not to the apostle, not to the evangelist, not to their pastor, but to God. And all of them are surrendered to God, from the apostle down to the lowest member that has no authoritative office whatsoever. And they are yielded to correction and reproof from the Word of God and further enlightenment in and by and from the Word of God. That's the true church. Well, I'm just getting started, ready to show you what happened to it, and here the time of this broadcast is up. And you'll have to hear it in the next program. Well, I told you, my friends, again, that so many people think they're saved and they're not. Now, that might happen to you. Don't be too sure. You buy insurance to protect yourself. Why don't you take out a little time as insurance to just check up to be sure? God's Word says prove all things. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.